Before I begin, this is part two of my Nier Automata analysis. If you haven't seen part one already, then go check that out before watching this. So put your TV thighs on the back burner and set your sights on good boy shorts because we're starting off Route B with none other than 9S. We've got a bunch of stuff to cover, so get yourself a warm drink and get comfy. Now my issue with Route B is that despite a few changes due to being in control of 9S, it isn't all that different from our initial adventures with 2B. And this is why I can't blame someone if they told me they stopped their playthrough halfway through this route. It feels more like a new game plus reward, which definitely isn't a bad thing, but considering how it's compulsory to go through this path in order to gain access to the three final endings, it'd be nice if it was of the same quality as Route A instead of feeling like a slight downgrade. Thankfully though, I like 9S. He adds something new to the gameplay which seems to be fairly divisive amongst people who've completed this title, and the bits which his route adds to the overall story fleshes out your overall understanding of Automata's universe. Plus, how can I say no to that fucking face? As far as what 9S's gameplay changes from 2B's, well, I think now is a good time as any to bring up exactly that the gameplay. It's fairly common knowledge now that Platinum Games developed this title, putting a lot of its younger devs in charge to give them their time to shine. The best way I can describe the gameplay to someone who's never played Automata is it's a hybrid of the RPG leveling system from Nier mixed with Bayonetta. 2B has her standard light and heavy attacks but can chain her weapons together to unleash stylish combos on her enemies. The way every character moves feels reminiscent to games like Metal Gear Revengeance and the aforementioned Bayonetta, but somehow it feels like this has improved significantly in Automata. Moving your characters around is so responsive and smooth and makes traversing the abandoned city a fun activity in itself. Pod042 serves as your artillery, and what I find really nice about this particular technique is you hold down the button you map this to and it will continue to fire as you chain together your physical attacks. Pod also serves as your magic caster, in a similar vein to Grimoire Vice. These attacks can be charged once you pick up multiple pods on your adventures. My personal favourite spell has to be the teleports behind you ad infinitum technique that not only decimates small groups of enemies, but also leaves me feeling much tougher than I actually am. Calm down guys, don't get too jealous. There's so much more in terms of gameplay customization that just makes me drool. 2B and 9S can both equip things called chips, which can serve as ways to buff your general attacks, but can also be used to add more gameplay elements to the base game. One playthrough, you can experiment with your sword, sending out massive shockwaves, but on the second playthrough, you can equip the ability to go into Bayonetta's Witch Time. Giving us the option to change gameplay elements around is not only fun on a first playthrough, but also gives people a good incentive to start the game again and experiment even more giving it hours more replay value. It's a really good new feature to the franchise and part of me hopes they stick with something similar for the next game. So, now that we're in control of 9S instead of 2B, how are things changed? Since 2B is an android built around combat, what can 9S, a scanner model, do in order to compensate for being physically and derriere impaired? They put a lot more focus on 9S's ability to hack. Hacking is now a mechanic which will stay with us to the very end of the game, and it definitely feels like Yoko Taro's dream of making a bullet hell shooter wriggled its way into Automata in more ways than one. Shame they didn't turn out that good though. Banter aside, whenever you do a heavy attack with 9S, he'll automatically start to hack the enemy he's locked onto. You're then whizzed into the enemy's main circuitry, where you do your best impression of that little cunt from the Jurassic Park movie in order to take control of the machine. Usually, the machine will detonate, causing a large amount of damage, but sometimes you can also have the option to take control of said machine or force it into being an ally. Honestly, the latter two choices are always weak as shit to me compared to, you know. As far as negatives go with this particular mechanic, apart from sometimes feeling like it breaks the flow of regular combat, the fact you can't automatically lock onto new enemies once your current target is down is by far the tiniest nit I can pick. You have to keep awkwardly pressing the lock on button to dispatch obstacles, and I felt that could have been cleaned up a little better. And from a visual viewpoint, well, as I brought up in part one, there isn't much to look at. Nothing really pops out at you, but maybe that was the whole point. That being said, Platinum Games did a really solid job with Nier Automata mechanics. Mechanically. There are a few things I'd say could be improved if there's a next time, but all in all they've done something I never thought they'd be able to do so accurately. They've taken the original Nier and elevated everything, making it one of the best evolutions of a base game I've seen in a sequel. You can even see the early days of a flight unit sections in the original Nier, so to see it being fully realised in Automata is kind of adorable. It really says something when the infamous Hideki Kamiya announced that it wouldn't really be an understatement to say that Automata saved Platinum Games 
Games from financial peril, saying, Nier's success has to this point given Platinum Games a new fan base, a growing staff, a brilliant success story, an increase in qualified job applicants, and a great benefit. After the disaster story that was scale-bound, it's nice to see a game series which has previously contained a man decimating soldiers whilst riding a dragon can throw a cheeky middle finger to the publisher that originally canned it. And while we're on the topic, not afraid to call you out, Release my child, you cowards! Yoko Taro responded to Kamiya's tweets in a Gameformer interview, saying, I think in part, that's just him being nice to us and talking us up. I think we've got a lot to thank for them as well, certainly all the young development staff I talked about. My personal response to Yoko Taro would have to be, stop being so modest and accept a few complimentary headpats. You've had a few bad games along the line, but you should wear this game's success as a badge of honour. Well done. Pat pat, you did it. So, with a basic explanation of the gameplay in Automata, it's time to move straight back to the story of Route B. We start off with 9S watching a young machine try to bring its deceased sibling back to life, 9S commenting on the fact that its efforts are fruitless. He notices 2B's flight unit is descending into the abandoned factory, so he sets off in order to meet her at the specified location. Better make sure he's actually dead next time. That was dangerous, ma'am. After 9S wakes up in the bunker, his memories wiped from the black box detonation, there's a large gap where you simply repeat a lot of the same content you did with 2B with a few line changes here and there. The most important ones being 9S's conversations with his operator, known as 210. Compared to 2B's operator, 6O, whose personality is about as bright as the fucking copied city, 210 is very harsh to 9S when he tries to start conversation, being much more of a get the job done kind of person rather than exchanging pleasantries. There's also the introduction of 9S's pod named Pod 153. Like Pod 042, it's entirely void of personality, but the differences between the two being its female sounding voice. During this route, the two pods communicate with one another, sharing data in order to make their jobs a little easier. Hello there, sugar tits. Greetings, you moldy looking cunt. Proposal. Tell that android fetus 9s that if he swivels that low gain neck around to shoot to be with the fuckney eyes, I'll tear him limb from limb. Proposal. Eat a bag of cocks then proceed to grow your own. Don't come swinging at my boy with that low gain shit when you can barely raise your own arms above your head. You dead ass fuck. Wow, though I lack the capacity to feel emotion, I have to admit I'm feeling a little stung. We're also given a little more insight into Adam and Eve, though a lot of it feels tastefully comical rather than informative. Eve questions a lot of the things Adam makes them do, such as eating apples, wearing clothes, and the fact he has a feminine name. Adam's replies are as simple as, because humans did it, humans didn't expose their dicks, and honey your name is fabulous, suck it up. The power of intercourse compels you to fuck me. Eve's puppy-like dependence on his brother is brought out even more during these cutscenes, and considering how we know this storyline between the two will end, only makes the looming final battle with Eve even more depressing. There's also a sizable chunk of new cutscenes revolving around the Forest Kingdom machines, and the struggle their nation has to undergo when their beloved king passed away. Instead of simply mourning his passing, they put him into the body of a baby, so he would eventually grow up and become their leader once more. However, no matter how many years pass, the infant machine never grows, yet the machines don't give up hope. The king of the forest can only remain trapped in this infant shell. The only thing it can do is merely watch and observe as a society he constructed crumbles around him. Which, I guess, is fairly similar to my Discord. And how could I have forgotten one of 9S's more important lines before they even enter the Forest Kingdom, where he asks 2B when she'll start calling him Nines. This is a nickname he presumably made up by himself, and he claims it's only a name friends call him. 2B, as usual, coolly brushes him off. Another inclusion that Root B adds that I love to pieces, a segment similar to the DLC storybook cutscenes in Drakengard 3. The first one we're introduced to is something I brought up in part 1, and that's a short story that would prove integral to the plot of Nier Automata. Within this short cutscene, we see a volcano eruption which brought forth a god who spoke to the machines. Consciousness, pain, joy, misery, fury, shame, 
desolation, the future, the meaning of life. What this boils down to is this God told the machines that emotions are the meaning of life. Now, if we go back in time, all the way back to my near analysis, you may remember me bringing up a short story called The Fire of Prometheus. For those of you who've forgotten, the short story tells us a P-33, a character from the original Nier, climbing his way to freedom out of a scrap heap in order to see the outside world. This being fueled by a single memory that remained from Khalil, a young deceased gestalt that befriended him. During his long ascent, P-33 assimilates many other machines into himself, becoming a collective consciousness of many rather than a being with a singular thought process. Once the P-33 collective discovered an exit, they used all of their firepower to escape making their ascent out of the mountains look exactly like a volcano eruption. This collective hacks into what appears to be the machine network, meaning that P-33, otherwise known as BP, was the catalyst of the machine's eventual growth and evolution, and feverish need to find out exactly what emotion is. In some strange way, the last order of what is essentially a human soul would become a seed, but would sprout within every single machine life form. That sproutling would later turn into a want to replicate the one who planted that seed of hope into BP. The other storybook segments aren't as lore crucial minus one, however they add more context to scenes we've previously encountered. Like how the giant machine in the ocean is actually childlike in nature, but was banished to the bottom of the ocean due to its previous rampages. It remained there alone, begging for its mother until the day we destroyed it. The one which I think holds a lot of significance is this one, where it shows us how the machines found something, which they call treasures. The machines called them treasures. Each treasure had a different shape. Each treasure had a different... I have a game. Now, I'm really sorry to have to say this, but I'll be returning to talk about the machines and their treasures later on into the analysis. I swear, I wish I could just spill it all now, but it would ruin the reveals, and God, I just want to make you guys happy. Clemsy just wants to do his best and doesn't want to let you down. Please forgive me, my loves. Moving on, the next big plot point which is unique to 9S is when he's launched off and kidnapped to the copied city by Adam. Whilst 2B was running frantically looking for her lost child, 9S's consciousness is being held captive within the machine network. It's here where 9S gets an intimate look into how the network functions, seeing that the machines have stored a vast amount of human data and practices within it, and comes to the realization that machines are imitating humanity. He also finds out that when machines try to accomplish something such as a dictatorship government, but that system fails, the machines will only repeat that dictatorship, meaning that machines are perpetually trapped repeating the same mistakes again and again. They cannot seem to learn. When it comes to combat skills, machines are able to evolve and improve their skills since that was what they were built to do. They were never built to have independent thought. They were never constructed with this irregularity in mind. After this, the voice of Adam begins to enter 9S's head. He tells 9S that through evolution, a new machine consciousness has been born, and then proceeds to mock 9S's refusal of this, essentially saying, we are so different, you and I. He brings up his love of hatred, and how 9S also harbors something like that deep within himself. As Adam's slow chipping away at 9S's mental state continues, he finally drops this bombshell. <laughs> Now, I know what a lot of people, myself included, initially thought. Many of you were probably slapping your thighs going, He said fuck, as in fuck with his long robo dong. But what if I were to tell you it actually has two meanings? What if I were to tell you that the other meaning is this? Now, there's been a lot of discussion about this particular moment, and I think it's worth talking about. The game has been teasing towards the idea that machines and androids are similar in many regards, despite strong opposition. And this line can definitely string together one comparison, the idea of love and death being intertwined, and how sexual urges and the act of killing are one and the same for androids and machines. I just can't subscribe to the idea that this blanked out word can solely mean fuck when Adam has just jumped off the whole hatred speech. One particular source I read quotes an Italian translator for the game, who claims this does indeed mean 
kill in English. However, it can be interchangeable with fuck since within the context of this conversation, they mean the same thing. Apparently, within other languages, the blanked out words can also be filled in with words that fit the quota of love, fuck and kill. So what does this reveal to us about 9S? Throughout most of the game, we see a friendly exterior to him, his relationship with 2B light-hearted, almost childish. Watch out for hostile enemies, 2B. Roger that, 9... Sir. Huh? Wait, what did you just say? Roger that, 9S. Wait, no, that's not what you said. You said 9s. Or at least something close to- SHUT YOUR FUCKING MOUTH! But this line from Adam reveals that behind this friendly exterior lies a darker side of him he keeps stored away. His potential romantic feelings towards 2B are being warped and distorted, since within the world of Automata, killing and being in combat releases a chemical within androids that resembles the human feeling of pleasure. I think this similarity between the two species is increased when, upon Adam's death, we see him cradle 2B as she impales him, in an embrace which seems incredibly intimate. With 9S now undergoing repairs in the bunker, once he's about to sync himself up with the bunker's server, he notices something a little strange. He hears a noise which causes him to postpone his sync, open a port of a bunker's server and go investigate where it came from. The 9S models are inherently curious after all. The first piece of info he comes across confuses him. Dear perfect stranger, I am Mano, a feral cat. Born in a Brooklyn alley, two years old, neutered, male, full of love with no place to put it. But I will give my love to perfect strangers. Will you love me back? The next piece of info confused him even more, especially since there's a barrier protecting it. He notices that the supplies being sent to the humans on the moon are practically empty. Pod 153 alerts 9S at the next point, telling him they're unauthorized to access this data, since it's about the Council of Humanity and Project Yorha. 9S predictably ignores this and takes a closer look. After avoiding an attack barrier which takes him by surprise, he comes across some data which seems to state that the Council of Humanity was formed as a part of Project Yorha something which he always thought was the other way around. We then find the source of the noise that originally got 9S's attention. The noise turns out to be none other than a recording of 9S's voice. After a long period of battles and adventures, the prophet spoke. He snapped out of it quickly though, as 2B has requested his backup in the abandoned factory. Whilst 9S helps 2B make her way past the zealous machines, if you deviate the course a little whilst hacking, you can come across some records on Project Gestalt. Completely optional, but a nice way to link the first game with its sequel. Finally, once you help in assisting 2B, 9S gets an important call from the commander. It's here where she drops the biggest bombshell in the game. I found records stating that the Council of Humanity was established as part of Project Yorha, but I'd always heard it was the other way around. So did Yorha actually create the Council of Humanity? Yes. We installed the Council of Humanity's server on the surface of the moon. But that means... Mankind no longer exists. Now, I'm not sure how everyone else felt when this revelation was dropped, but I can safely say my reaction was a mixture of relief and a feeling of crushing loneliness. The relief was due to confirmation that there wasn't a retcon around Project Gestalt failing at all. And in fact, the ruse not only tricked the androids, but me as well. The androids were giving up on reasons to live, so this Council of Humanity was formed as a way for the androids to have a god worth fighting for. The only thing human on the moon being the data of the Gestalt's DNA being stored within a server. This relief, however, slowly started to turn to sadness. Now knowing for certain that humanity just didn't make it after the white chlorination epidemic and Project Gestalt. Within the context of the game's universe, it made me feel incredibly lonely and cold. Something else struck me at this point, and it's something I haven't felt for an odd 18 years. The sensation I felt was similar to when I discovered Santa wasn't real. I remember when I first found out Santa wasn't real. I was on a train with my mother and I asked, Mother dear, is Santa real? To which she replied, No, my child. He is about as real as me. I am not your mother. She was removed from this world five years ago by none other than my stained, yellow gloved hands. Take them from me, my child. Take them. 
and carry on my legacy. Santa! Now I know for androids, finding out that the creatures that created you being extinct is a little more intense than finding out a fat man who gives you presents once a year is no more than a fantasy. But I still felt it, even if it was a flicker. And it makes me wonder if that same feeling was rushing over 9S as well. As a child, I needed to completely reevaluate the world around me after finding out this truth, since it hit me that if Santa wasn't real, nor was magic, the Tooth Fairy, Vegeta, take that feeling and amplify it for 9S. The gods you are serving are false. Your reason for living has been unceremoniously taken away from you. 9S, now bearing the overwhelmingly heavy news of humanity's demise, responds to an SOS due to Eve's growing insanity on Earth. He goes straight to his flight unit, where a ghostly figure of a small girl watches him silently in the corner. This same figure appears yet again as 2B kills 9S. However, now there's more than one. Two figures both adopting the form of a young girl wearing a red dress. Route B ends exactly the same as Route A, and it's at this point where people try to skip the credits in order to get back to the main menu. However, it appears the game has a totally different idea. We see 2B preparing herself for a massive battle with the machines, which considering how Adam and Eve are both destroyed, could mean victory for the androids at last. As the credits end, we get what looks to be a movie trailer about future events to come. Since now, we've essentially passed what I like to call the beginner's wall, as Route C and D have officially begun. Before we launch ourselves into it, however, I first need to bring up something a few of you have wanted me to cover within these analysis videos. The side quests. This is important to bring up now, not only for future story purposes, but also to serve as an explanation as to why I don't cover them that much. I tend to leave a majority of a side quest out of these videos, so if a new player picks up the game after, let's say, only watching my near videos and intentionally spoiling it for themselves, which by the way is A-OK, -okay, more power to you, but they're still left with a mountain of content to dive into that I didn't spoil for them. I feel it gives people more of an incentive to go out and buy these titles and expand their knowledge of a game outside of my videos, which really only show a window of their full potential. The side quest I feel I need to go into though is called Your Her Betrayal. This simply boils down to Operator 6-0 relaying orders from the commander, telling 2B and 9S to capture some Your Her troops who've attacked the resistance camp and stolen supplies. After eventually catching up to them and annihilating the first two, their captain arrives. Furious at the death of her two subordinates, she tries to take us down but ultimately fails, dying with her comrades. When 9S and 2B make it back to the resistance camp, an enemy informs them both that the troops didn't steal anything from the camp at all. It would seem that the commander had lied to 2B and 9S, but for what purpose? Even 210 informs 9S to be careful. The question is, who should he be careful of? The commander briefs the Yorha troops about Adam and Eve's demise, the machine network being flung into complete disarray. Before 9S is able to decide on whether to tell 2B about the fate of humanity or not, he and the other scanner models are sent to disable the machine's anti-air system to give the troops even more of an advantage. 9S notices something a little different about 210. She's being a lot more motherly than usual, which is strange considering her usual personality is fairly... No smiling, no breathing, no eye contact, no looking in my general direction. Emotions are prohibited, cunt. This continues on till 9S finishes his task. Her new way of speaking seems more condescending to him than complimentary. In the meantime, 2B makes her way down to Earth on her flight unit. The falsified voice of the Council of Humanity speaks to all of the units, a brief reminder to us that nothing they're hearing right now is real. When 2B lands, she's assigned a squadron as they start taking out the machines on the ground. No matter how many they take down, it appears their numbers are endless. This is when the machines unleash a close-range EMP attack which completely knocks out the Yorha troops. 9S rushes in to save 2B, but more and more strange events begin to unfold. Until finally... Is this... a white area virus? Huh? The hell? This bodes well. 
The Logic Virus has taken over every Yorha troop on the ground, minus 2B and 9S, due to hacking in and repairing her before any lasting damage occurred. Whilst I'm talking about the Logic Virus, I need to quickly correct something I stated in my first video. The Logic Virus is an android-wide disease, not just members of Yorha. Whoopsie. After escaping with their lives, the duo make their way back to the bunker as fast as they can, in order to inform the commander of the disaster back on Earth. The commander, however, assumes both units have gone mad, and sentences them to be detained. But, no sooner than she sends the order... <laughs> Bingo! This bodes well. 2B and 9S now have to protect the commander from the onslaught of infected Yorha troops, where a voice being channeled through Operator 6.0 tells them that this was orchestrated by the machines, being able to speak through the network and the virus. Out of all of the times you've spoken to machines thus far, this is the most sadistic they've ever come across. <laughs> Taking the commander, we flee through the infected hallway of the bunker and make it to the flight units, where the commander reveals that she can't come with us. The commander goes down with her ship as 2B and 9S are sent hurtling back towards Earth. The opening credits begin to roll, signifying that everything we've done before has simply been a prelude to the core events of Automata. Meaning, the first two endings were merely an introduction to Near Automata. Whilst the opening credits are still rolling, the duo are being hunted down by infected members of Yorha. 2B requests she takes control of 9S's flight unit in order to take them both out of there, but it seems she manually sends him away from the flight unit for his own safety. She crash lands into a group of enemy forces, and it's not long before the logic virus slowly starts to eat away at 2B as well. The next 5-10 to 10 minutes are some of the most tense and heartbreaking moments I've had in recent gaming memory. You need to drag 2B away from any living android in the area, as she knows the virus will completely take over her system and potentially spread. The the further and further she gets, the more her vision will become distorted and her limp will worsen. Eventually, like a wolf finding a quiet place to die, she finds the perfect spot. It's here where we meet again with A2, 2B requesting one final thing from her, to take her sword, which now contains all of her memories. 9S frantically sprints through the abandoned city, having finally tracked down 2B, but he didn't make it fast enough. And with that, it's time to wrap up part two. Thanks yet again for your patience and support, and I hope this is worth the wait. I'm gonna try my best to wrap things up in part three, but as with everything, we'll have to see how that goes. Let's just say with the amount of information I still need to cover, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a part four, but don't hold me to that. I'm planning on covering all of the bits I said I'd come back to, as well as talking about the deceptive marketing tactic they did, with a special guest. I'm going to apologise in advance if the video takes longer than a month to complete. February is going to be a crazy busy month for me, but if it takes longer than anticipated, I may release more than one podcast. Let me know your thoughts on that. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more, and sharing this series with people who you think might get a kick out of it. Donating to me on Patreon is also a really good way to support me and the channel, so if you want to see what kind of benefits you'll get from that, please check out the link found down below, and join the list of names scrolling by on the right. Thanks again for watching everyone, I'll see you all next time.